God, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me for our scripture reading for our sermon this morning. Today we're once again in the letter to the Hebrews. Today we're going to look at chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. The letter to the Hebrews, we're going to read together, not sing, like, like I said last week, read together. Verses 1 and 2. So I'm going to ask you to please stand as we read together Holy Scripture. This is God's holy word for us, His people. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. This is God's holy word for us, His people. Let's ask Him to bless our time in His word. Father, we do ask that you would indeed bless the reading of your word. We know that your word is inspired. It is full of divine power and life. And just the mere hearing of the words are able to convict and to change our hearts and lives. But we pray now that you would bless especially the preaching, the exposition, the teaching of your word. May it be broken open and all of its fullness flow forth to us today. May your Holy Spirit take your truth from your word. Write it upon our hearts and mark our lives by a biblical walk with you. We ask this for your glory and for our good in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. All right, so you may be noticing a pattern from last week to this. Last week we looked at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And now we've, uh, we've not jumped forward, we've gone backwards to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 2. Wouldn't that be an interesting series if I started at the end of a book and just preached the first two verses of all the chapters backwards to the beginning? That would be an interesting sermon series. And actually, there is a book uh, by a New Testament scholar named Scott McKnight, uh, and it's called Reading Romans Backwards. It's not a full-scale commentary in the traditional sense of a commentary, but it is an interpretation, an exposition of the book of Romans, and that's exactly what he does. He starts with chapter 16, the very end of the letter, and he works his way back to the beginning. Very interesting way to do it. You could maybe see some connections start to pop out if you start at the end and go backwards. Um, how, many people, how many of you have seen the, the show Psych? All right, for the two of you who have... <laughs> Actually, it doesn't matter if you've seen it. The point is, my, my best friend back home, he absolutely adores this, this show, loves the show Psych. I think, I think the, se- the series has concluded. I, think it's, I, think, I don't think they're making any new episodes. But uh, he went and started with the series finale, the last episode of the whole series, and watched it first. And he literally did watch the entire series backwards, from the finale to the, to the original, to the pilot. <laughs> and I just thought, why? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> just, just a new way to do it, I guess. So he literally, he watched it backwards to, to the front, and then he started over and watched it from the front to the back. And he's like, you know, you, you, you discover a lot of stuff if you, if you do it that way. You see a lot of connections. Actually, you see a lot of stuff that makes no sense at first. And then you get back to, oh, that's why that happened later, even though I saw that first. So it can be very confusing. Don't worry, we're not going to go through the whole letter this way. But what I want you to notice is that we're taking a similar approach this week uh, because of a word at the beginning of last week's text. Hebrews 12, 1 starts with the word, therefore. Therefore, and as a cute way to make you remember this, anytime you see the word therefore, you should ask, why is this therefore? Therefore. (laughs) What's this therefore? Therefore. You should always ask, why is that sitting there? And the word therefore always points you to what just came before. Because that happened, now listen to this that follows from it. So we skipped that last week. We just dove right into 12, 1 and 2. Today we're going to take a step back and see why is the therefore. Therefore. 
what is underneath last week's text. Last week, we talked about running the Christian race. And we looked at how the text in 12, 1 and 2 unpacks three different ways or the three ways in which we should be running that race. How do you run? When you're on the track, when you're running the Christian race, living the Christian life, it gives us three ways to do that. Listen to the crowd. Lose the weight. Look at Jesus. Right? That was last week. This week, we move backwards and we see what is anchoring these instructions. We go to the therefore, and we back up to chapter 11. Now, I read verses 1 and 2, but this is going to be a... I'm going to be using the rest of the chapter as well. I just didn't want to read the whole chapter. We are in the race of the Christian life, and our reward awaits us at the finish line. But the question is, what does it take to finish the race? We've seen how we're supposed to run it once we're running it last week. But what does it take to finish the race? And the answer we're going to see this week from our passage is faith. It requires faith. We must run the race with faith. In our passage and in the larger context of chapter 11, <clears throat> the author illustrates and defines for us three aspects of the kind of faith we need to run the race and finish strong and win the prize of your heavenly reward. Three aspects. The first is the nature of faith. The second is the promise of faith, and the third is the life of faith. So let's take these up one at a time. We'll look first at the nature of faith. And by looking at these three, we will see how it is that we are to run in a way that completes the race and receives the prize. First, we need to know what the nature of faith is. If someone asked you for a definition of faith, what would you say? How would you define faith for someone who asked you? There are probably many definitions that are biblically appropriate. But the closest thing to an actual definition in the Bible is here in Hebrews chapter 11. The definition of something tells you the nature of that something. The definition captures a thing's essence. What is faith? What is its essence? What is its nature? That's what a definition captures for you. So here we get a definition by a description of the essence of faith. The nature of faith is defined for us in our chapter both in verse 1 and in verse 6. Let's look at each of these. Verse 1, Hebrews 11, 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So this definition has two pieces. It has assurance and it has conviction. Faith, by its nature, includes assurance and conviction. And these are almost in a poetic parallel with each other. They almost, they overlap greatly, but there's distinctions between the two. When we talk about assurance, assurance of things hoped for, oftentimes, you know, we, we use the word hope in a sort of flimsy way. Like, do you think dad's going to be home in time to play catch? Oh, I don't know. I hope so. Fingers crossed. And we have this sort of, yeah, I, I really hope it goes this way, but who knows if it really will, it, and it very well may not. And, and that's one way we use, we use hope. But here, faith doesn't include a fingers crossed, man, I really hope so. Here, hope includes assurance, so that we have hope for things that God promises, and then faith is the assurance 
that that hope is solid and secure. Faith is the assurance that what we hope for is secure. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean intellectual certainty, where it's, it's absolutely, literally impossible to doubt something. Like, I, you can say you doubt that 2 plus 2 is 4, and that it really could be 44. You could say that, and maybe if you were a, a philosophy major, you could get away with it. I was a philosophy major. <laughs> but I know, and you know, you don't really believe that. You, don't, you, you know that 2 and 2 doesn't make 22, it makes 4. And all your protests to the contrary are, are just you playing with me. So it's not really possible for you to doubt something if you have certainty. But we all know that genuine believers with real faith can go through ups and downs in their level of confidence, in the amount of assurance that they have, in the amount of certainty that they have. So we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that if you're not 100% certain of something, where it's beyond the possibility to even be doubted, if you don't have that level, you don't really have faith, and you're just unbelieving. Don't make that mistake. Absolute certainty isn't part of the essence of faith. It's not in the definition. Notice it doesn't say faith is the certainty of things hoped for. Now, God's Word is solid. God's Word is certain. His promises cannot fail. But our confidence in that goes up and down. Our faith can be small, it can be weak, or it can be strong, and it can be supremely confident. But I'm, I'm so thankful the Bible doesn't make absolute certainty part of the definition of faith because then none of us would really have it. It says it's the assurance, and that is this inner confidence, this rock-solid confidence that our hope really is secure. Faith perceives the reality without the reality already being present. It's the assurance of things hoped for. So the thing you're hoping for isn't here yet. Otherwise, you wouldn't be hoping for it, right? Did your Amazon package come? Yeah, I got it yesterday, but I hope it comes tomorrow. Now, you don't hope for what you already have. You have it. You know, Jeff Fox, where they told a joke about a person who lost his wallet, and he said, and you know, uh, the joke is uh, people always say, did you find your wallet, Terry? Well, yeah, it was in the last place that I looked. I was like, well, of course it was. Where else would it be? You know, Terry, did you find your wallet yet? Yeah, but I'm still looking for it. <laughs> Love Jeff Fox, right? <laughs> That's right. We don't hope for things we already have. So this is assurance for something we don't have yet. And in fact, the word assurance there is the Greek word for a substance, for an object, for a thing, a tangible, touchable thing, a substance. It's the substance of the thing we hope for. Faith is able to perceive the reality of what we're hoping for before we've already got it. It can see it. It can see the reality before it arrives. And it knows that it's on the way. Faith is the assurance of things that we hope for. The other word here is conviction. Faith is the conviction of things that we cannot see. So assurance and conviction somewhat overlap, and then what we hope for and what we can't see overlap as well. We don't see the thing we're hoping for yet, but faith, the eyes of faith is able to see it out there coming our way. And this word conviction, is the Greek word there means, an, means evidence, proof, demonstration. Faith carries its own inner convincing. Faith carries its own inner convincing and it carries its own outward demonstration. Faith is able to perceive not just the reality of the thing we're hoping for, it also perceives the proof of the things that we can't see. People talk about, tell you, if you can't see it and touch it and feel it, it's not real. And here, faith is something that cuts through that surface level 
lie that if it's not per- perceivable by our five senses, then it's not real. Faith understands that there are invisible things. There are non-physical things. There are immaterial things. There are promises. There are truths. There are rewards. There are things that God has for us that we don't see yet and that aren't tangible. And for all we can tell, it doesn't look like, <laughs> it doesn't look like we're on our way to a reward. If you look at the world or you look at your life, you think, you know, all these promises, God, I don't see them coming to pass. Faith is able to cut through all that, and it's the assurance of something we're hoping for, and it carries its own convincing within itself. This is why faith is a supernatural thing. When God gives you the gift of faith, He awakens in you confidence and conviction that what He says in His Word is true, and that what He promises is real, and what you hope for really is out there, really is on its way. Faith perceives the reality of what we're hoping for with assurance. Faith perceives the evidence of what we cannot currently see with conviction. That's the definition in verse 1. Look at verse 6. It says, Without faith it is impossible to please Him, to please God, because, for, whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Very interesting. Faith does two things. It believes that God exists, and it believes that if I draw near to God, He will reward me. Now, a lot of us might feel initially a bit put off by that. You mean that Part of faith is coming to God for a reward? That sounds, I don't know, selfish or like, should I just be coming to God for God? And it's like, well, well, sure, come to God for God. But if God says, come to me and I'll give you a reward, you shouldn't ignore that. (laughs) If God's trying to motivate you to come to him by saying, look at all the good I have for you, it would be a bit of a, of a smack in the face to say, yeah, yeah, keep, you can keep that. I don't, I'm not looking for that. No, he has these wonderful promises of glorious reward. That's the thing you're hoping for. That's the thing you're convinced of, even though you can't currently see it. God and his gifts. And you want God, not because you'd rather just have his gifts, and then once you have the gift, you can get rid of him. So it's not God without his gifts, and it's not his gifts without him. It's both. He is a giving God. He is a gracious God, a promise-making, rewarding God. And faith means believing both that there is a God and that He has a reward for His people who draw near to Him. Faith is the assurance and conviction that there is a true and living God and that He does have rewards promised for us that we can hope for things that aren't here yet, but that He promises us for the future. This is how we're supposed to approach Him. And this verse says, this is how we have to please Him. Without this kind of faith, verse 6 says, it's impossible to please God. So let's not try to be more holy than God. (laughs) If He says, the way you please me is you believe in me and believe in in the good gifts that I promised to you, and you come to me, so you can have me and the gift. And if, you know, let's not try to be, you know, holier than God and say, yeah, yeah, I, I don't want the gifts, God. I just, you know. Like, I know that kind of that might feel pious, but God wants to give you good. He wants to bless you. He wants you to have all the things he's promised for you. And the way we please him is that we draw near to him and we seek His face, and we seek the good He promises us. Now, I said a minute ago about verse 1 that the conviction of things not seen, that conviction means an evidence, and the evidence isn't just our own inner conviction on the inside, how we feel, but it also refers to we can see the faith of others, through their lives. 
And when we see the evidence of faith in God's people, that is also a further confirmation for us that the promises are true. When we watch somebody else receive the promises and walk in the power, when we see God moving in their lives, we see evidence that God is keeping His Word. And that's why verse 2 says, For by it, by faith, this assurance and conviction, the people of old, in the Old Testament, received their commendation. They were commended, they were approved, they were celebrated, they were praised because of their tremendous, tremendous faith. And they pleased God. And we can look at them and we can see the evidence that the very things we're hoping for, they hoped for too. And they walked in God's promises, they walked in God's pleasure, they walked in God's ways and they received the things that were promised. And so we can watch them and we can see the evidence for ourselves. For by it the people of old received their commendation. Now as we go through the rest of the chapter, as you read forward, you can see all these different demonstrations, all these different pieces of evidence, all these proofs that are supposed to strengthen our conviction in the things that are not seen and strengthen our assurance in the things we hope for. So just look at a couple of these. The the chapter's full of them. I just want to highlight a couple in the next few verses. These are demonstrations of the nature of faith. We've given the definition. Here's a demonstration of what that faith looks like in action. First of all, it includes knowledge and understanding. Verse 3, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Right? Conviction of things not seen. What was made, what exists, was made out of things that are invisible, meaning made by a God that we cannot see with our physical senses. By faith, it says we understand. Faith is a means of knowledge. It's one of the ways we actually learn something. Uh, The Figures in church history are famous for saying things like, slogans like, faith seeking understanding, or I believe in order that I might understand. We hear the word of God, and by faith we are assured that it's true, we're convinced that it's true by the supernatural gift of faith, and through that faith we have knowledge of reality that's not open to other people who don't have faith, who are looking for knowledge from other sources that contradict Scripture. Faith includes a way of understanding. It includes knowledge. And through faith, we can actually grow in our knowledge. It also includes the attitude of our hearts. Verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Faith, uh, Abel offered a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain did because of his faith. The attitude of the heart in which Abel offered his sacrifice was pleasing to God and Cain's was not. Why wasn't Cain's sacrifice pleasing to God? It it lacked faith. It lacked faith. So faith includes our knowledge and understanding. It has an intellectual aspect. Faith includes the attitude of our hearts, sort of the posture and the disposition in which we approach God to offer Him gifts and to serve Him. That's an attitude of the heart. Faith also includes the way we walk, the way we live our lives. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. This is in the book of Genesis. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. That's what verse 2 was saying. The people of old received their commendation. Because of their faith. Here, Enoch is an example of someone who walked with the Lord and was pleasing to him. So, faith includes our intellects, it includes knowledge and understanding, it includes the attitude of our hearts, 
It includes the way we live our lives in a way that's pleasing to God. And the last demonstration, just the last example I'll pull from this, is in verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, right, the conviction of things not seen, by faith, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So Noah hears God's word, I'm going to flood the world. If you don't want to be washed away with the rest, you need to build this ark, and I will save you and your family in that ark. Now, Noah has a choice. He can either believe that an enormous deluge of water is going to flood everything and think, well, man, I better get busy cutting and sawing and measuring and building right now. Or I can be, yeah, I don't know if that's true or not. Has God really said? Did He really mean that? I don't know. It's never rained that much. Um, I can't really build a boat that big. How am I supposed? I can't do it by myself. And yeah, just all the all, all the justifications for why God can be doubted or the word's not true or there's not really going to be a flood. No, what are you? Why are you building that boat, man? What are you doing? It's not. You know that's just this is this is nonsense. You're a religious fanatic. You're a freak. What are you doing? And Noah, it says, he built the ark and condemned the world. He built the ark and by it condemned the world. Because they doubted, they did not have faith. He believed God's word. He, be he had assurance of something that he could not see, a coming flood. He believed that God would save him from that flood. And he did what God commanded. So faith has assurance and conviction of things hoped for and things not seen. Faith includes our knowledge and understanding. Faith includes the attitude of our hearts. Faith includes the way we walk in our daily lives, pleasing the Lord. And faith, from Noah's example, includes trusting His Word and obeying Him, even in the face of mockery, skepticism, every reason to doubt. We trust and we obey. You see, faith is not merely believing something is true in our heads. You know, Martin Luther called that story faith. You read someone a story and of the gospel, and it's like, do you believe the story is true? Sure. That was me before I became, before I actually got converted. That was me. You could ask me any question about, about the Bible that my seventh grade self could comprehend. And you know, and people did. Do you believe in God, Wesley? Well, yeah, sure I do. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe Jesus Christ was a real person who died on a cross and rose from the dead for you and your sins? Well, yeah, of course. I've heard that from day one. Grew up in a Christian home. Of course I know that. But it was just up here. Because in daily life, it meant literally nothing to me. I couldn't possibly have cared less about it. But it was just like, I know the answer on the quiz at Sunday school. And that's it. There was no life inside. My faith was just nodding my head at the appropriate you know, option on the multiple choice test. It did not include knowledge and understanding. It didn't convince my mind. My heart wasn't captivated by this. I wasn't walking with the Lord. Faith didn't move my legs into the path of obedience. There was no trusting and obeying. None of that. It was just a head nod and it meant nothing else. So that when I got converted... Everything changed. My mind was changed. My heart was changed. My daily life changed. All of a sudden, God had His way with me every day of the week, and not just occasionally at youth group or on Sunday. Now I trusted. I believed this stuff. This stuff was reality. There was assurance. There was conviction. Everything changed. That's why faith is a supernatural gift of God. It radically alters you from top to bottom, head to toe, inside and out. Faith is something that comes from your whole being and controls your whole body and sets you to running the Christian race. That's the nature of faith. 
Now, second, the promise of faith. The promise of faith. Go back to verse 6. It says, Without faith it's impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Faith is the pursuit of a rewarding God. God calls us to Himself and He promises us a reward if we will draw near to Him. God puts us in a race called the Christian life and He promises you, dear Christian runner, He promises you a prize if you will endure to the end and finish the race in faith. Faith looks forward expectantly because faith holds tremendous promise. Just like we had demonstrations of the nature of faith, let's look at two demonstrations of the promise of faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews. We'll look at Abraham, and then we'll look at Moses. So first, Abraham. We're told in this chapter that Abraham was looking for the city of God. He was called out of his homeland to go to a new land and You know, we read Genesis and we think it's just about the promised land, right? Just about the land of Canaan. But Hebrews says Abraham wasn't just looking for an earthly patch of real estate in the Middle East. He was called to something much greater and much higher. He was journeying not just to an earthly land flowing with milk and honey, but he was looking for the city of God ultimately. That's what he was called to. To inherit. So let's look at what it says here about Abraham. Start in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, right? The land of Canaan. And he went out not knowing where he was going. That's faith. (laughs) Lord, where are we going? I'll tell you when we get there. Okay, you're you're in the driver's seat. I'm along for the ride. By faith, verse 9, Abraham went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, for because he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. A city with foundations that are designed and built by God, the heavenly architect. He was looking for the city of God. And then verse 11 adds his wife Sarah. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she, was, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Abraham was looking forward to a city. Because he had the promise of faith out in front of him, he was able to leave his father's house. He was able to leave his kindred, his country, his land, his home, his ancestors, the graves of his people. He left them there in Ur of the Chaldeans, and he trusted God. He, didn't, he just knew, go that way. You don't know where you're going to stop. You don't know where it's going to end. You don't know everything I have in store, but that's the way you go, and I'll tell you when you get there. And once you get there, I'll tell you what happens next. But you're going to have to take it step a direction at a time from me. I'm not going to give you the full maps layout of how this is going to go. And so he had to step out. He had to go. And all he knew was There's a land of promise, but beyond just a land of promise, there is a heavenly city of God waiting for me on the other side of Canaan. And that's how Abraham was able to go and to obey and to walk. Facing uncertainty and fearful odds, he believed the word of God and he was able to go. What enabled him to do that? The promise of the reward that was in front of him. He knew he was journeying towards a tremendous promised inheritance. That's Abraham. Uh, Shortly after this section, he concludes the section 
of Abraham's reward by saying this in verse 14. He says, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. In other words, an earthly land. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Abraham desired a heavenly country. Now look at Moses, his example. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking to the reward. How was Moses able to say, you know what, I got it really nice here in the palace the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, I have it really nice, I have wealth, I have comfort, I have power, I have security, I have everything. I have the riches of Egypt. But he considered it better to go suffer with the slaves than to stay in the palace with the Egyptians because they were his people. And he would rather be with them. And he was not frightened by the anger of the Pharaoh. He was not intimidated by the suffering that would come his way if he tried to go be with his people and lead an exodus and all that. He considered the reproach of Christ. Isn't that interesting? Moses, Christ hadn't come yet. <laughs> and yet he considered the reproach of Christ to be preferred to the comforts and conveniences of Egypt. In other words, Moses is walking in that same race that we are walking in. And he too was sharing in the sufferings of Christ before the sufferings had happened, just as we now on the other side of the cross share in his sufferings by looking back and taking up our cross and following him. This is what Moses did and what motivated him and what kept him going was that promise of reward. He was looking to the reward. He would rather be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. That's how you overcome sin in your life, is by faith and looking to that reward, which will be sweeter and better than anything sin lies to you and promise, promises you. Those are the demonstrations of faith. Moses and Abraham, then there's more in the chapter. We'll just look at those two. And now see in their example, see by how by faith Abraham and Moses ran their race with endurance because they had the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And they believed that God is faithful and will indeed reward those who seek him. Finally, the life of faith. We've seen the nature of faith and the promise of faith. We end with the life of faith. Notice this about Abraham and Moses. Great examples, great demonstrations of, the, of how you look to the promise and walk by faith and endure whatever comes your way. Great examples. But Abraham and Moses did not see all of God's promises fulfilled in their own lifetimes. Right. Abraham had this promise that I'm going to make you into a great nation and you are going to be as numerous as the sand on the beach and the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed that promise, but he died way before that was fulfilled, right? I mean, he couldn't possibly live long enough to see his family get to the size of an entire country. He died way before that was fulfilled. He walked in the faith of that promise, but he knew he would never personally see that promise in this life. Future generations will see it. In fact, Moses saw it. Moses saw the fulfillment of Abraham's promise. But then even Moses, who had the promise of entering the land of Canaan, he got to see it from the mountaintop, but he didn't get to go in. He had the promise, and he walked by faith in that promise, but he didn't actually inherit that one. Future generations will. Joshua got to inherit Moses' promise. And so there's this pattern in Scripture of, of people who are given these tremendous promises 
that will be one day fulfilled for a future generation, and you're supposed to walk in that faith that a future generation is going to see that promise fulfilled. See, the Bible's generational in its thinking. It's not individualistic. It thinks in terms of families, ancestors, descendants, generations. And it makes promises to lineages of people, not just you as an individual. We are not guaranteed, you and I are not guaranteed that we will personally witness all God's promises come to pass in this life. Look at verse 13. He just got through talking about Abraham and Sarah, etc. And he says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. We are strangers and exiles here, wandering through this world onto the city of God, the celestial city, the promise, the reward, the inheritance. We're in a race, on a journey, heading to a destination, and there are lots of things promised to you in this life, but one of them is not. All God's promises will be, will be realized in your own life, this side of the resurrection. Abraham had a promise, and he knew that's a promise for my descendants. It's not a promise for me. But I can walk in the faith of that promise, knowing that God will be faithful to my descendants. In this life, some of us will experience amazing victories, miracles, rest and comfort. And others of us will experience tremendous difficulty, great sorrow, and unbelievable suffering. Look at the end, towards the end of the chapter, verse 32 and following. The author summarizes his recap of these Old Testament heroes by saying, What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Man, can you believe that? This miraculous, amazing life of faith. God giving us all this victory, these miracles, this power. Right? More than conquerors, right? And then in the same breath, second half of verse 35, he says, some were tortured. Whoa. That came out of nowhere. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. There's that reward. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And in chapter 12, he even says this about Jesus, verse 3, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In this life, we will experience a mixture of these, and some will experience a majority of victory, and some will experience a majority of suffering. The point is, faith is not a promise or an entitlement to a life of ease. To a life of nothing but affluence and comfort and convenience and no difficulties and no hardships. Faith doesn't promise us that. Being a Christian doesn't guarantee that. Having a life where we see God doing tremendous things for ourselves and through us and for others and having the comforts and conveniences of life, that's a possibility that many of us have. But there are just as many good, faithful, godly Christians who live a life of one tragedy and trauma after another. 
Faith does not promise us which track you will be on in the Christian life. It just tells you that whichever track you're on, you're heading to the same reward at the end. And that which track you're on, the circumstances of a comfortable track and the circumstances of a suffering track don't tell you whether or not you're actually going to the promise. You can't say, I'm suffering, so God must not have good planned for me, or I have good in my life, and so I'm definitely on my way. Whichever track God has you on in the Christian race, they both head to the same reward, some through great victory and others through great sorrow. The race of the Christian life is an adventure, and it requires courage, and it requires endurance. Let us run the race with endurance. The chapter ends this way, verses 39 and 40. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. As I mentioned last week about this verse, all this hall of fame of Old Testament saints and believers, they were not perfected without us. They finished their race, they crossed the finish line, but the medals haven't been handed out yet. They are standing there cheering us on, waiting for us to cross the finish line as well. And in the middle of the crowd is Jesus, who says, look at me, come to me. I have the eternal reward you seek. They were not perfected without us, and that means you will be perfected with them if you endure to the end in faith. Go, Christian. Run the race that is set before you. Run it in faith. Run it in a life full of faith with the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And if you will run to the end faithfully, you will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Enter into a kingdom that was prepared for you before the foundation of the world. Therefore, 12.1, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you give us the gift of faith. And we ask that you would increase our faith. That you would give us the full conviction and assurance that are at the heart of faith. Those of us who are struggling in our faith, increase it, we pray. Help us to walk with full confidence in you. Give us the knowledge, the heart attitude, the walk, the will, the trust and obedience to run this race with endurance, to keep our eyes fixed upon Christ, to keep our hopes set upon the reward you have promised to us, and may we strive and stretch forward to that finish line with all we have. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.